So welcome, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, we invited Al Elliott, and um, he is on his way, I hope. But in the meantime, um, a couple of other great friends have come by, old friend and new friend. <laughs> Would both of you introduce yourselves, and we could pick up the conversation from there. And then hopefully Al will be here, and a couple of others may be showing up too. Um, could you say your name for me one more time? I'm going to write it down. I'm Parvati Anant Narai, and I'm a teacher, a 12th grade teacher in English. Um, I teach as part of a humanities team at New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in New Orleans. Very cool. And you were just describing, um, let me shut my door a little further here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, you were just describing a unit that your kids are doing and they're ready to, gonna, they're going to be blogging about it, having to do with how do we memorialize war? Well, the unit itself is about that. So the stage we're on, so it's kind of conceptualized the unit, we get at different stages to the unit. I, I guess it's kind of like the same structure as the, the playlist structure where they do these sequenced kind of activities and readings and that things that lead them to the ultimate kind of project or question. And um, so the stage we're on right now is we've just been studying World War II and uh, in specifically, we're looking at um, the, the Holocaust. And as part of that study, a project, kind of self-reflection project that they're going to be participating in is to think about um, how to confront uh, hate speech or, or dangerous speech in their own kind of um, experience. And so they're going to think about hate speech intervention or dangerous speech intervention through a, a, a kind of a design thinking type activity, which would allow them to rebuild, first begin by building a sense of empathy or some sense of understanding of where the anxieties of people who participate in this, in hate speech comes from and where are, what is their um, kind of, what, what are they responding to socially? What are they responding to in terms of media messages? And then for them to um, to brainstorm or figure out what they've tried in terms of dialogue and participation or intervention before, and where has what has that resulted in, and then to problem solve by imagining different ways in which they would um, approach a situation of hate speech or bigoted action themselves. And as part of that, they would come up with all kinds of. Uh, different solutions, I imagine. I mean, I, I would think it would range the gamut. They're, most of them are artists, so they would have a lot of artistic responses and uh, how they would would actually intervene or create solutions or dialogue. And I and then at the end of that activity, uh, part of their writing is going to be to go back and approach the question of um, how do I challenge my own complicity. And that's the blog that they're going to attempt to write. Their own complicity in hate speech. Well, complicity because we're going to look at the, the how the Holocaust was essentially a result. Okay, complicity. Uh -huh. So not being silent when you see a witness hate or bullying is a form of complicity. Well, and I'm glad these kids are seniors, but I wish they were older than that. <laughs> this is deep. I'm just saying. Uh, so. But I have a couple um, obvious local questions to ask. Is I mean, when, when you mention memorializing war, I immediately thought of the statues that were brought down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So is that in the mix or? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, mm -hmm. um, we were thinking about um, different, looking at different kind of nationally famous, you know, memorials to think about what is the impact they have? I mean, and two locally that definitely we have to talk about is the Confederate monuments, those statues that were brought down. Uh, and also the narrative that is spun at our World War II Museum, which is the next That's, That was gonna be my second question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a museum that's kind of, in many ways, interesting. It's, it's kind of problematic because it very much adopts the whole greatest generation narrative of you know talking about World War II as this really, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for them to actually kind of grapple with that and see if they can suss out how problematic it is to have a singular definition of how we remember these events. 
It, well, I guess I should introduce Chris, myself. Yes, sorry, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but hey everybody, Chris Rogers in Philly, um, now a doctoral student um, studying literacy. Um, I heard that very recently. I was so excited to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't, this is at Penn? Soon we'll ask, I'll ask if you're gonna be in Philly this weekend, but I wanna not. Go on go ahead. No, the okay. topic of now, which is this unit around memorializing war. And the first thing that came to mind for me is um, Viet Thanh wins uh, Nothing Ever Dies. Are you familiar with this book, Parvati? No, I, I don't know this. Oh, okay. I'm gonna grab it off the shelf in a second. But it's a- This is what Chris does, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, by- uh, um, The title of that for me, Chris? Yeah, it's called Nothing Ever Dies. Okay. And I'm looking for, I'm right next to my shelf, so I'm looking for it. Okay, I see it, I can grab it in a second. But um, it's a book that focuses on, it's a, a Vietnamese refugee uh -huh. that was writing, uh, who's a, like a, a, um, a much awarded, critically acclaimed writer now. And he's writing a, around the memorialization of the Vietnam War, both within the United States, but also within Vietnam. Um, and sort of like compares and contrasts these experiences or these writings against one another to come up with this idea of what he calls um, a just ethics of memory. Ooh, okay. Which um, is like an amazing, like, I, I love it, I like the layers of it. And what, and this is a bad sort of like reduction of the amazing work that he does there. But um, one of the things he says is that a just ethics of memory, uh, like always re remembers that in hum like humanity and inhumanity are tied and what? that our ability to be human is directly tied to our, um, ability to be inhumane. So it's like, the uh, how do, in some ways he says like the way that, particularly like the American story, right? Is that we fight against this narrative that we were wrong or that we committed evil acts. Mm -hmm. And by positioning the United States as like this, you know, savior actor against in that. So all the ways and all the, the ways that we try to position ourselves as against or outside of inhumanity, mm -hmm. he would say, takes us out of the right to be human. Huh. But I'm gonna grab the book, I'm gonna show you too. <laughs> That's cool, that's really cool that you have a, a book in so life. I, can you say, what's it yeah. look like in, you know, so the, the term is just ethics of memory. So if you, if you Google that, um, you'll find like a, a really short piece that I think does a good job of introduction because this book's pretty thick. But um, yeah, it's about like Vietnam and a memory of war. And I, I, I love the idea of like, we, we do have to like fight against the propaganda, right? The sort of like nationalist propaganda mm -hmm. um, to be able to say like, we, we are really, we are capable of evil. <laughs> like, wow. we, and the fact that we remember that makes us pay attention to what we do. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think so. You had a question just a second ago, Paul. Oh, I was just going to continue the <laughs> the dialogue. Um, more the um, I, another thing that came to mind, and I just put it in the chat. I don't know if you saw it there. Is um, Brooke Gladstone does this really kind of wonderful, it's, they've put it on a couple of times on the media, um, interview with um, some historians in Germany thinking about the Holocaust and um, in reference to the slavery, slavery memorials and so forth in, is, where, in Alabama, is it? Um, the lynching memorial? Yeah, the lynching memorial. Yes, so you. kind of comparing like how they dealt with their memories and histories of, of the Holocaust with how we're beginning to and how long it's taken us to do that mm -hmm. um, was was it's a really interesting sort of 20 minute um, piece of audio 
that, it's uh, uh, Gladstone. You said is his name. Uh, her name, yeah. Um, it's on on the media. It was okay. a section of on the media. I think she did it back in the summer, but they've rebroadcast it recently. I put a link in for it here. You know, I don't know how to see the chat simultaneously. Oh. Uh, the top left, you hit the um, blue icon. There's a green one with a screen share, and then yeah, uh, above that, there's a chat one. It's like a blue one with some white lines on it. I don't it's not showing up for you, huh? It's not showing up for me. It's just the wow. uh, sh screen share and the showcase. That's all. Huh. Oh, I'll drop it in that other chat we got going on. Should be. And I'll I'll, um, I'll email it to you. So. Okay, I'm I'm wondering if there's can something you. Wrong. Can you I, like? I, I love how deep this got fast, but but <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm swimming a little bit with how youth are getting a hold of it. Like, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. yeah I kind of do, it that way. do you know what I mean by that? I mean, okay, what's it look like in the classroom? What are they? So I think I think yeah. the, the way we're getting at it is by layering very very slowly layering uh, and arriving at at the big at these this question of, you know, how do we remember war? So we we started, as I said, with reading Julio Otsukas. We started by saying, okay, this is our, going to be our the way we're going to approach World War II. And um, mm -hmm. we began with that novel, When the Emperor Was Divine by Otsuka, and we looked at Japanese internment. And part of their writing and their thinking through that process was to first grapple with, you know, how much did they already know about Japanese internment and our our um, treatment of Americans during World War II within our own boundaries. And many of them were very taken aback by, you know, the kind of constitutional violations that had taken place and how, um, how World War II was always, sh you know, sh shown as the single story, kind of this narrative of valor mm -hmm. and glory and our, you know, liberating the world, etc. And so we start there, and then we move from that novel to then looking at um, reading just a straight up historical text, because it's a humanities class, the history text, which we usually do from the American Yop of the World War II, you know, all of the events historically that took place. So they're doing chronologies and understanding like what happened across the globe and specifically with American involvement. Then we come back and start looking at um, how we uh, the the kind of deeper look look at the Holocaust itself. So we used a film um, to look at Nazi aesthetics because there's this film called The Architecture of Doom, and in it, this the filmmaker Peter Cohen basically argues that you know a lot is said about this kind of sense of pure evil that somehow Hitler is purely evil, the Nazis are purely evil, and therefore we have this phenomenon of Nazism. He actually argues in that film that it's not. It's it's much more complex than that. It's it's actually about um, a sense of aesthetics that does not permit them to recognize the Nazi to recognize humanity in other people outside of this paradigm of aesthetics. So we, they then look at that and they start to try to understand like what makes people make choices to dehumanize others to the extent that it took place during the Holocaust. Then we start thinking about like, how did this even take place? How could this happen on such a national scale and at the scale that it did? And so then we get at the question of complicity, which I just talked about a little while ago and how in order for something like this to happen, part of it is buying into the ideology, but a lot of it is also becoming complicit in that ideology by being a bystander. and. You know, when when is your silence actually a part of the violence that takes place? So then they unpack the complicity activity and we, we then get at, um, so part of re responding is to actually speak up when you see something wrong. But part of it is also that after years after something like this takes place is how you actually continue to remember that this has happened, but you do so for an ethical imperative. So to get at that, we look at actually the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin and um, how this memorial itself is, is a very stark physical reminder. I see someone else is doing this. Yes, but finish your sentence, keep going. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, so then we look at that memorial and then they, they reflect on whether it's an effective way to continue 
remember the Holocaust. And then we look at other memorials, this time looking larger at World War II and how it's been memorialized. And that brings us to the, the question of now, what do you do with the history of something like war? Can you remember it only in one way? And in America, their final project eventually becomes to think about designing their own way of memorializing the World War II experience in America. So that would go back to the Japanese internment now and start to include those narratives. So we're gonna to get to see some of the writing the kids do around I'm all this. Wow, I can't wait. It's uh, amazing. Al, you're here, great. Hey, what's happening? Sorry I'm late. That's cool. Um, Parvati got us going here though. Um, and uh, our old friend uh, Chris Rogers is with us. Hi. When I invited hey, Chris, Chris, when I invited Chris, Chris said, "Well, for Al, I'll come." That's exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, shout out, Chris. This but part so, of the, um, stay with us and and join the conversation if you don't mind. Um, and no, but, I don't mind. and and but, but if you don't mind, I want to kind of focus on what's going on with Al because it's been a while. It's um, been a minute. Some people might say. Um, but um, can you, I, and I've been so excited to see how many things you've been involved with. Um, things are kind of popping for you right now. Um, can, introduce yourself, Al. How would you do that? Hi, I'm Al Elliott. I am the impresario of Allocation Lab. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I coined that last summer. Okay. My, my mom told me. My mom told me I was an impresario. I really didn't know what that was, so I looked <laughs> it up. And it's actually, so I ordered some business cards. I actually spelled it wrong. So there's an <laughs> I and there's an E. So <laughs> for real, tr true story. So I use the E on my card, but like, so an impresario when you spell it with an I is kind of like um. I guess a musical spins out, golly, like somebody that organizes music events and whatever, whatever. So that's that's what I meant. But an impresario with an E is actually a colonizer. Ooh, oh, wow. It's, 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 it's like, the <laughs> it's what, kind of like the Spanish conquistadors that first came over oh, to wow. like, you know, so because I'm literally trying to reshape the culture, I like the impresario with the E because I'm trying to colonize what's been colonized, so. I think I've misspelled it now on purpose. But yeah, I'm the impresario Education Labs. Ha <laughs> ha. So I've been I've been listening and listening over and over again to your your uh, re recently dropped album of music. Okay, hustling Pretty backwards. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So is that is that how you say it? Uh, hustling. Yeah. Backwards? That yes. I'm pronounce it's literally the word hustling backwards. So it's the name yeah, of the album. It's not. Notice. It's yeah. unpronounceable. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so in, in that, I was going to quote and see how many times we could quote from it tonight. But one of the things that so somebody in there works nine to five in, as a teacher. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I just, right wanted, to, lyrics, I just yeah. wanted to, yeah. to spot that uh, that is what you do nine to five, correct? Yeah, Probably like not yeah, nine from to nine to five, I am, I am a fifth grade educator. Fifth grade. I teach this year, I teach social studies and science. Um, which is which has been completely amazing, um, and then yeah, and I'm also currently. I think it's studying the social my, studies and science. Weren't you a math teacher? I was a math teacher. I was a. I taught the art of language, <laughs> and okay. so this year I am social studies and science. And there are probably a million different reasons how I ended up getting that assignment, but uh, okay, but it worked out though. It's it's cool. Um, yeah. Al, which, which city are you in? I'm near Birmingham, Alabama, but I'm in Hoover, Alabama. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm in New Orleans, um, just because we haven't met yet. Okay, cool. And okay. you're from Bessemer, though, right? I was born and raised in Bessemer, taught there 15 years, and Hoover is literally like, okay, I'm on exit 10. If I drive 10 miles the other way, I'll be in Bessemer. So I'm at Bessemer, not really, you know. But I teach in Hoover. Hoover is more, I guess, uh, the uh, affluent suburb of Birmingham. Okay. I was in the news recently for like the mall shooting that y'all here heard, heard about. Mm -hmm. so yeah. That's, yeah. I, yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, my 
my son works at that mall and was at the mall that night, Thanksgiving, when all that happened. So I'm I'm in that area, but it's Birmingham, who Bessemer, but yeah. So, what else? You're you're acting. Yes, um, I've been in. Uh, first of all, I'm currently actually right now. I'm reading. I actually kind of forgot. I'm reading lines now. I'm practicing because I'm Troy in Fences. The Alabama School of Fine Art is putting on a production of Fences with the Steel Magic Theater, and I have, um, you know, I'll, I'll be portraying Troy. So that'll be fun. How'd you yeah. get involved with that? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, I'll audition. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Say that, that, my my favorite line. Oh, what 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 did he say to the son? The son is like, "Do you like me?" Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you read that. Yeah, part. yeah. Wait, part. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like, thank you. What law is there? Say I gotta like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that's my part. That's the one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So and and the, and. And so the cast is mostly the students of the Alabama School of Fine Arts. So it's it's been a uh, you know a real treat to kind of get to play in their their sandbox, so to speak. So it's yeah, a high school. doing that. Alabama School of Fine Arts is a high yeah, school. Alabama School of Fine Arts is a high school. Wait, oh, so these are high school kids you're doing this with? Some of them are. Some of them are not. Okay. I am not. Me <laughs> and Bono are not in high school. Everyone else is in high school. All right. So, Matter of fact, Rose, uh, played by uh, Amina, she actually just earned a, well, I mean, I think it's like seventy-two or ninety-two thousand dollars college scholarship on acting. So these are like, these oh, wow. are like the good students. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, these are the A students. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm taking notes from them, asking them how to remember, you know, this amount of material. We have like discussions at rehearsal, like you know the uh, director's favorite line is, "So, what are you feeling right now?" You know what I mean. So you kind of have to figure out what you feel. I keep messing my lines up because I really talk like Troy. So sometimes I don't know if it's the line, mm -hmm. or if I don't know if it's what I'm saying, and so I think I messed up. And they were like, "No, no, that's the line." I was like, "Oh, so that's kind of <laughs> fun." <laughs> Because I, you know, I, I hear my voice so much in Troy. It's, you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> but yeah, but that'll be fun. And then also, uh, Mark Marin uh, is starring in a film called Sword of Trust, directed by mm -hmm. Lynn Shelton. And now they shot that in Birmingham. And that'll so be making its world to... premiere in South by Southwest. Sorry, Jim. Okay. Yeah. What's the guy echo going on, Harry? Uh, Sorry. That's hey, okay. How are you? That's good enough. Good. Hey. I'll introduce you in a second. But I, I, before you got here, we were talking about how do you memorialize war? So I thought, oh, you could tell your story about the sword. <laughs> oh, yes. Kind of. Yeah. Well, the movie is kind of about a sword. Uh, but it's really is almost the movie is actually smarter than I think the audience is going to like really understand until they see it. Because it is a comedy, but it's such a smart comedy. Uh, I'm not just saying it because I'm in it. Um, but it really is kind of be yeah. because it's, it's, it's a movie talking about basically, um, not to give away any spoil spoilers, but long story short, they have found a sword that proves the South won the war. And so this, this particular sword <laughs> becomes valuable. Right, and so that's kind of what the whole movie is about. Um, this sword and, and how you know it's like an heirloom of that period of time, and so there are organizations that'll pay top dollar for it. So, yeah, the comedy kind of ensues after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're not done with the introductions here yet. <laughs> so, what else are you up to? Oh, um, so I don't know if it, so it is written is a public writing assignment where you take uh, 12 songwriters. I call them scribes. And, and this based is on suggestion, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, this is going to be. Well, it is written is when I have 12 scribes and based on suggestion from the audience, we give them an hour plus a pen and a pad to write a high 16. 
this Saturday and Sunday, we're doing four It Is Written in two days. And that rotation of 12 scribes, I'm calling the writer's block. Um, and so there'll be, yeah, like a lot of songs and uh, music and art and all of that. But basically the point of it is it's kind of like based on those suggestions, the artists that are actually writing the songs are all like top tier artists in and of itself. So the songs, like this will be the sixth official time I've done it is written, but everybody that does it is written as a talented artist already. So it's not like a competition. It's more like a showcase. Yeah. And that's this Saturday and Sunday. So what's happening during that hour? Like, so, okay, great question. So, so I get the 12 scribes, right? Nine of the scribes are going to go downstairs and they're going to take an hour to write. Then three of the scribes are going to take, uh, like they're going to do like a 15 minutes performance and a five minute interview. And so it'll be three of those. And so each of three of those 20 minutes will be the hour, but I'm calling each of those like an episode of a show I'm calling Where There's a Vibe. So for the audience, if you come, you will see like a person do a five minute interview then perform for 15 minutes. You'll see that three times. And then I bring up the scribes and we say team one, they'll come up with the songs they wrote. Team two, they'll come up with the songs they wrote. Team three will come up with the songs they wrote. Thank you and good night. We'll do it again at eight o'clock. That's awesome. So the yeah. performers who are doing the 15 minute performance and five minute interview, is it something they've already prepared in advance? Or is yeah, it yeah, yeah. This would be like, if, if, if I was going to do it, I would perform songs from my new album and just do an interview like that. So everybody would get an opportunity to showcase their own individual talents and what they got going on. And then almost as an exercise, they'll jump in the gene pool and kind of come up with these songs that the audience suggested. Yes. Oh, is, is Paul still there? I'm not sure. Oh, did he freeze? I think. Oh, he's... I think. Oh, okay. I think he's gone. Paul has left his own party. He's still recording. <laughs> Um, while we wait for Paul to come back, we should introduce Harry. Harry, yes. where are you? Where are you at in the world? Um, let's see. I'm on mute in here. There we go. Yeah. Hi. I'm in Delaware. Um, so this is my second year back in Delaware. I uh, had moved to Mexico for six years. So this is my second year back after New Mexico. And, uh, I had left Delaware before to go to Mexico, so now I'm back in Mexico and Delaware again. So, and I just I work in a high school, um, and I work as a librarian. I used to be an English teacher before I left for Mexico, and then I uh, got my information science so I could work in the library. But now I work in the library. So, Which yeah. city? So are I just. You in, Harry? I'm sorry. Hello. Sorry. Uh, what's oh, my name? Um, my name is Harry uh, Brake, and uh, the school that I work at is Woodbridge High School. It's in kind of middle Delaware, and <laughs> when I worked at in Mexico, it was the American School Foundation. So it was American School in Mexico. So, yeah. And are you like you voices, fam? Which uh, how did you? Sorry, say it again. Are I, like in terms of like a meeting with Paul? Did you come? To meet Paul through the writing project or you voices or um I think yeah there was a uh, a person that had come to our school that did um, she came to our school and she basically just set up lessons based on digital literacy for a while when I was at uh, the previous school in Delaware and so she had a connection with Paul saying hey you should meet this guy because they do this kind of interactive stuff that you do in your high school so uh, my goal is just basically, you know, I would do like weird things, you know, just to get the kids involved. Um, it's a pretty low income area where I work at and it's in Southern Delaware. So it's about, I don't know. So I think our school right now is like, uh, it's, it's about 70 low uh, and reduced income kind of school. Um, we get a lot of students from different countries and um, it's weird. It's like a 30% homeless rate schools that are homeless. Mm. And so uh, there's a lot of different factors, you know, that go into that. But then, like, we have a lot of buy-in as far as how we get the kids connected. So, you know, when I was an English teacher, we'd put a camera in their hands and say, go out and take some pictures. We're going to do transfer that I today. You know, it's just, like, really hands-on project-based. Right. So that worked really well with the technology. Yeah. So 
yeah, we have to be creative pretty much every day. But that, the reason why I wanted to be in the library was because when I was in the English classroom, you know, just it was more and more based on not testing. And so that didn't leave me much creativity to actually reach the kids where I needed to reach them. So when I was able to go back and get my librarian degree, now I have a little bit more freedom where I can flow uh, into the classrooms all the time. And I can do that project based up with the kids. So that's why I prefer, you know, to get down and, you know, nitty gritty and do stuff with it instead of not being able to, I just don't want to focus on testing more than I can help that out a lot. Yeah. I am. Um, Harry, welcome. Um, I'm back, by the way. And thank you for keeping oh. going without my being here. Um, <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, good. You're all connecting. I want to try to keep the focus on Al tonight because there's so much going on. And one of the, um, one, there are like three other teachers like, like Al. Nobody's quite like Al. But, um, but there, there's another teacher who is across the hall from a, a, a class I teach a couple times a week um, who just released a, an album. Um, and, uh, and then there are like, I know three or four, I know three cartoonists, um, teachers who do comics, right, on the side. So, so I'm just totally fascinated by how amazing teachers are. So that's one of the sub-themes I have <laughs> for tonight. Um, and focusing on you, Al, if you don't mind. Um, no, I don't mind. You don't mind. <laughs> okay. So tell us about storytelling, too, because that's another part of you. Okay, so about four years ago, I met up at a coffee shop with this story. It was just a, this storytelling event called Arc Stories, and, and so I signed up to do it. But it was kind of like the they had just partnered up with the radio station here. Uh, I guess our local NPR affiliate WBHM, and so they were in the process of like making these stories their own, like podcasts or recorded series. I really needed more practice because I wanted to do a TEDx Birmingham talk. So I kind of first started telling stories in Birmingham because I was used to being on stage performing and rapping, but just standing up there talking to people was just a different animal. And so like I, uh, over like the past two years, I probably have told six, six seven, eight stories or whatnot. Uh, then I actually, so when I was able to do the TEDx Birmingham talk, it was, you know, it was a, it was a more familiar I guess way to perform and share uh, but yeah so like through telling art stories just here just kind of trying to build up to do a TEDx and so now I get to coach doing TEDx I'm actually coaching one of the speakers this year they've actually made it a two-day event this year so it'll be May I think May 2nd and May 3rd in Birmingham this year so yeah so that'll that's cool too but the stuff that's yeah. on Bound Cloud what is that yeah, stuff on SoundCloud is just uh, a playlist of some of the stories that I've told. So I know, like, uh, I guess the most one of the most interesting stories I think is the head in, in my granddaddy's freezer. Uh, I actually, they actually partnered with the Sidewalk Film Festival here in town, and so they had certain storytellers tell stories that should have been movies or could have been movies. So that was a story that I told. But it is, you know, the, the stories just have to be, you know, all the stories are true and you can't use props and you just kind of have to, you know, tell the story of something that happened. So I told the story of this, this head that had been in my granddad's freezer for over 20 years that I found, like, that I had to dig out because the freezer had thawed out and unplugged over, like, all these years. It was just this sheet of ice in it. Oh, it wasn't a human head. It was a deer head. But it was a rumored deer head. Uh, I know, like, so when I first started teaching, I was teaching in Bessemer, which is actually where my grandparents were still living and where I grew up. So I would go by and see my grandparents after school. So I went by, I was talking to my granddad one day, and he was talking about this deer that he had hunted. Well, I was going fishing with my granddaddy before, but I had never been hunting. So I'm listening. You'll sound all interesting. Now, at the time, I think I may be 27, 28. My granddad may have been 70, I think, 60. I don't know. He was getting up there. But uh, he was talking about this deer that he killed, and he was talking about this head that he never got mounted. But he was talking about it in the present tense. <laughs> like, he kept saying, yeah, you know, in the head I had, whatever. So my aunt is a nurse. So I called my aunt and said, Audrey, I'm talking, you know, granddad. And he says, it's, you know, it's a, it's a deer head in the freezer. She's like, oh, yeah, it's a dead out in the freezer. This is 20 years earlier than the last time my granddad had been on. 
So I go out in the back. Long story short, I never noticed his two deep freezers in his shed in his outhouse or with his back house. So one of them you open up, it's just, you know, food. But the other one in the back, it was frozen all the way up to the top. And so I unplugged it because I thought the ice would just thaw out. And then, but it didn't thaw out. So I went back there with a pick and a little, you know, chink, 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 chisel every day. And I finally dug this huge, massive, black plastic bag out. I took it took it to the taxidermist and I asked them, you know, I left it in the car. And I said, hey, so you know how you go to the museums? You see those woolly mammoths in there? Because they found them, like, you know, in South Pole or something like How difficult would it be to do that if you were a taxidermist, if I found that? He was like, I don't know. Depends on how well preserved it was. And I told him about the story. And he said, if you ever dig that thing out, I'd like to take a look at it. And I was like, I got it in the car. So I went out to the car, <laughs> brought it in there. He called the next day. They had enough stuff. And the only time in my life I ever saw my granddaddy die was when we presented him this deer head. Now, what was weird about it <laughs> is he was even talking about the number of points on the animal. He's very specific. Oh, yeah, it was a nine-pointer, blah, blah, blah. But if you count that deer head's points, it's five points on one antler and four on the other. I still have that deer head in my living room. <laughs> like, and that's that's why the story worked, because it wasn't odd to me that the deer head was. And people always like, what are you doing with the deer head? And I tell the story, it's like, that did not happen. I was like, yeah. So, yeah, that really happened. You know, I dug a deer head out of my granddaddy's freezer over 20 years old. It was still in there. You know. I love um, the woolly mammoths angle. The angles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want him to know how crazy it sounded until I was in, you know, I was, you know, I was thinking of something similar. So, yeah, but the others are just other stories that I've, you know, I think I think it's the story of the one time I got pulled over by the police, the time I accidentally killed Santa Claus. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> just, you know, so it's, it's almost like a, a mixtape of stories, <laughs> so to speak. So this is your site at Al Elliot. Yeah. Dot me? Yeah, yeah. If you go to Al Elliot dot me, yeah, because there was so much stuff that I was trying to put on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I was like, I really just need a website. But there are links, like all of those links are live. So if there's an ARC stories link, if you click that, it'll take you to, I think, six or seven stories. Uh, the album, but yeah, but everything's on there that's kind of happening right now. So this is the writer's block, right? Yeah, that's a that's a press release for the uh, writer's block, and I think. When it Maybe comes my up, internet I think will or will not hold up. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to see, and here's the album. I wanted to play a couple of the songs, but uh, I don't think I'm going to attempt that. Um, yes, eight songs, and actually it was designed to be enjoyed both forward and backwards. The intro is the last song on the album. Mm -hmm. So you actually could listen to it in reverse order, and it, it actually still works. Yeah. Why, but, yeah. why did you choose to do that? Uh, so 10 years ago, when I was working on my third album, the name of it was Hustling Backwards. And, and since that time, I have discovered the power of words. And so I realized that as long as I was kind of professing I was hustling backwards, I really was. And so I literally wanted to stop hustling backwards, but I also wanted to keep the name. So by literally hustling forward, but just showing the word backwards, I kind of I, I kind of get to cheat the curse of the language, so to speak. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of what it is. And so I always perform the songs in reverse order. I'm like mm -hmm. creating a, um, a a Mandela effect with the album. Like I'm going to start a rumor that it was like a mess up at the printers and the album was supposed to be in other order. It's going to be like a little marketing campaign. It'll come out with, with the uh, coffee shop tour. <laughs> They're like, why are, you, why are you doing the songs backwards? No, actually it was a mix up at the printers. This is that order. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so, why the intro is and, and you you did release and my, I, I don't know what's going on with my internet but you did release uh, uh, they're on medium you, the, the lyrics as well oh yeah yeah if you go on medium the lyrics to the album i actually released the lyrics before i released the album okay so yeah you can you you can read all the words or learn the words to your favorite songs so yeah but yeah the so first that, song is like live and it's, it's actually the first song I, I really just sing is me, it's a saxophonist, and a friend of mine, Vic Bell, he's a great producer. Um, but then now the interesting thing about that song is me are and these, the saxophonist. Are these all um, um, Birmingham are artists or not? These friends? Wait, what? 
Oh, no. Well, some of them are. Okay. King Tall T, the guy who produced the second and third song, his name is King Tall T. He's actually from Bessemer, and we recorded those songs in Bessemer. Vic Bell, I have three studio albums on, I guess, music media, and I've never actually done an album without him. He hadn't produced all of the songs, but we've always worked together. He's just a friend of mine. I actually met him selling sneakers before we even knew we did music together. We used to sell shoes like over 20 years ago in Hibbit Sport. Mm-hmm. So he lives in Georgia now. And on the 19th of every month this year, he's releasing an album. His birthday is December 19th. He released the album on his birthday. And so every 19th this year, he says he's going to release like an instrumental album. So Vic Bell, look him mm-hmm. up. He, he's awesome. I, I I love elementary. Can can uh, I know there are some double entendres there that I probably don't get, but can you play that one for your fifth graders or not? Yeah, it's actually one of my fifth graders' favorite songs. So this okay. is this is what I do. The songs that don't have cursing in it. <laughs> those, <laughs> those are the songs that I've conveniently made my playlist on my YouTube channel because I know that's how they're gonna try to find it. <laughs> but uh yeah, so elementary then there's, there's I say hell, but I use it in context. So <laughs> it's not even like the place. So it's kinda <laughs> kinda not Which, cussing. And there are a couple other ones. I love the Michael Jackson one. Just, the Michael uh, Jackson one is actually ten years old and I thought so. Yeah, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so you get to hear the ten year younger me. But I had never released that song as a song. So ten years ago when we entered the sidewalk, um they have a music video making competition where you give you 48 hours and they randomly match a band with a film team and to make a music video so that's the music video that won that competition that year so we were just happy that we won and i never put the song out as a song which is oh we won and i went back to work it's like you know what it'd be cool to put that song on this album and so we put that song but if you go back and look at the music video that's still on youtube for the song it says it's going to be on the Hustling Backwards album, but I actually spelled out the word Hustling Backwards. So that's kind of a little. And at the very beginning of the video, you'll notice the word American is misspelled. There's no I in American. There's no I in racism either. It's a team sport, but that's ironic. Okay. Um, what else did I wanted to mention about it? Oh. So I, I, it was my re- the, the mentioning of elementary and how you, you might be able to play that one for your students. I'm wondering how your life, and we've sketched out some of it, it's kind of amazing what you're working on, um, does impact on you as a teacher. Do they know you as uh, who you are? And okay. How does, that, how does that work for you? Okay, so it's kind of like double entendre some of this stuff I threw before I left the room. Like, we shot this movie last May. So it was like the last month of school. We about to get out. So when I got the part in the movie, I didn't really know. I don't really watch Netflix and TV. So I didn't know Mark Marin had a hit show on Netflix at the time. I really didn't. So I didn't know how nervous. I, huh? The most popular podcast in the world. I knew about the podcast, right? And but but I re- I didn't I don't listen to it regularly. I just knew of the podcast. So I thought here's a here's a comedian. He does a podcast. I didn't know he had a brand new stand up on Netflix. Like at the time, it was like so with that same batch of comedians like Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, all those comedians that had a new stand up come to Netflix. He had a new stand up come to Netflix. I didn't know that. Okay, I didn't know a lot of his um, you know successes and stories. And so this whole movie is an improv movie. So, like, we made up everything we say in the movie. They'll come and explain the beat to you. You say, okay, in this scenario, this is happening, this is happening. So when we would show up on the set, I didn't know this is how. Look, I don't know Hollywood. I'm a school teacher. So when we on the set, <laughs> at first I'm trying to talk out the scene. And the director was like, no, you can't practice it. You just got to show up. And, you know, if you make up something now, that's what you're going to be thinking about when you get on the set. You just got to make up something when you walk out. I'm like, okay. So the whole movie is, is you know, just what we decided to say, that kind of what we thought that character would say in this scenario. And I play the next door neighbor to Mark Marin. So I own like the hot dog and hamburger stand next to the pawn shop where the sword ends up. 
But it's one of those companies where all this stuff happens in one day. You see what I mean? Like, oh, you know, yeah. they end up in the back of them. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. So are you going to South by Southwest? Yes. Yes. I'm definitely trying to go down there to make the premiere. Yeah. You know, they got the whole EDU conference that happens the week before, too. Let me tell you, man. So I was going to try to go to both. I was going to are you gonna be down there a week before? Nah, I, I I know you know Jose, right? Jose Wilson. Yeah, have you met Jose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I know of him, but yeah. But nah, I'm not. Okay. Yeah, I I don't know how early I'm gonna be able to get down. Oh. I mean, not because the huh? I don't think you answered my question. I'm gonna be. <laughs> oh, but let me tell you. Oh, so no, 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 no. But 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 to answer your question, so. <laughs> It kind of goes hand in really hand. Well around it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, it kind of goes hand in hand. So when when I say hand in hand, um, the stuff that I do outside of school is kind of like the stuff I would be doing if I weren't teaching, right? So I never stopped doing the stuff. I would be doing if I wasn't teaching. The first year I started teaching, I had a record deal. So I dropped my first album at the, the, I was in my first classroom. You see what I mean? So this has kind of always been like a parallel um, of things I'm doing. So it's, the, it's, it's not so much for me, how do I juggle all this? It's almost like just letting other people see what the rest of my life is like. You know what I mean? Like, for example, I, I narrated a movie... It's called Open Secret. Uh, if, if you if you go if you go to my website and you click in the media, it's one of the links in there. You can watch. It's a thirty minute documentary, but it's about the nineteen oh one Constitution of Alabama and, and how institutionally racist it was intentionally set up and how that's still our Constitution today. So that was that's a film. You know, IMDb certified or whatever. Uh, I've actually entered the Sidewalk Film Festival myself. Is as an artist, like I submitted a movie last year, they snubbed it, but I submitted it. Uh, <laughs> but even before that, I've been in the, in their uh, other little movie making competition. Like they had a a horror movie comp uh, competition last fall, and I entered a, a movie called uh, um, what was it Johnny Over Easy, where like uh, you know how you have uh, the Elf on the Shelf. Well, this is kind of like the, the, when I first started teaching at Hoover, I didn't know Elf on the Shelf was real. I never heard of that before. So a kid had brought the elf on the shelf to school. And I thought I was being funny. And I was teasing the kid, but I was asking, like, why would they bring a haunted dog, this possessed dog to school? It's like, it's not possessed. I said, you telling me this dog's tearing your house up? Don't ever bring this demonized dog to school. Well, I didn't know I was upsetting the child. I, didn't, I You know, I thought the child was being funny. I thought they had made that up. Like, it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard of. Elf on the shelf. You don't get that demonized doll out of here. So the movie is about Johnny by the books and like a real reaction that someone would have if if your nephew or somebody can even tell you all the stuff this doll is doing. So I end up setting like setting the doll on fire, and killing it, and the bones of the doll come back and haunt me or whatever. But so just I guess being a part of the cinema or acting or whatever has has always kind of been a part of my wheelhouse. But I just think, like, right now I'm kind of getting the opportunity to do it in a more public way. So it just looks different to people that don't know me. The people that know me is, is almost like it's overdue. Like, hey, what took you so long? <laughs> you're, oh, I, I get the quote again. Uh, you're an overnight success, but the night was long, right? Man, it's been a long night. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and really the album is a testament to – a lot of things. I know, like, I've been on here talking about a book I was writing. So I was, I was trying to write a book, and then I realized that's not how I write. And I was trying to conform to yeah. a medium that, we, that, that is, that's, that's not how I art. We did a, so whole, that kinda, we did a whole show giving you feedback on that first I remember. chapter. So, I, I remember. I remember. Wait, you I just remember. said that's not how you art? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, books are not really how I art. You know, this is how I art. And so instead of me doing It Is Written, so I've been doing It Is Written for two years now. This will be the second year. So the year before last, we did it at the Birmingham Museum of Art was the first one. So I've done it at the Birmingham Museum of Art, a place called Saturn, a place called Workplay, just several different places here. But every time, that's 12 different artists that I'm creating with. And so me just being around artists, 
you know, the album came. Okay, that first song, Elementary, I recorded that song the weekend before school started. And so that's what was on my mind. So I came, I was, I was with a friend of mine. I was over King Toss Tea House. He was just making up this track, like just making music. And as I was listening to it, he just kept saying elementary. I just keep hearing elementary. So I said one, two. So I wrote the verse, right? And so we recorded that song. It was just therapy for my weekend stress before school got back in. You see what I mean? So from August, I finished the last song, New Year's Eve. I, I wrote the intro New Year's Eve day and finished the album by like 1.30. So from August to September, with all other stuff you see I'm doing, rehearsing for fences, teaching dot or whatever, and doing it is written. I did Petty Friday, which was like uh you know, another event. Um, but those songs are kind of like just, you know, pickup games. You see what I mean? Like for example, the song Poop Pow Be Gone, I was just having to be staying in Atlanta when my son was in a play. My 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 son performed in a play in Georgia. So I was spending the night and that was the song my friend Vic was working on. And I had just actually uh you know, was, was that's just what came out. Um, and so that's how those songs were kind of created. So really it's kind of like these moments, those songs, uh, I could tell you real life, it's really just how I art, you know what I mean? And so it was just a more effortless way of sharing myself with the world. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of how that happened. How do you find the time? How do you balance your artist? life and teaching life to find my son is 19 <laughs> so like you know my, my son's been out of high school for two years now this will be his second year and so you know he he's gainfully employed he's working he, he he's adulting quite nicely and so now like i i tell people all the time i'm officially in my midlife crisis you know what i'm saying like i'm looking for a convertible and a young girlfriend these are jokes i'm joking <laughs> I don't need a convertible. <laughs> uh, it's raining now, right? Who needs a convertible? We want sun moves. Um, but yeah, so that has kind of allowed me, I, I guess, just, you know, a, a, a type of freedom, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That I, I really didn't. So it's, it's just not about, I guess, really finding the time as, as much as it being able to redirect my, my time. And so instead of sitting here wondering what to do with, do with a lot of that time, you know, I kind of already knew. I just didn't have the time to do it. So, yeah. How did I do it before now? <laughs> That's really the question. How have I done it all these years? <laughs> but I also think, too, because of that, I'm able to organize in a way that I haven't been able to organize in, in a, uh, a way. And if you go back and listen to some of my older albums, like, I understand the term uh, being before your time. Because a lot of things that I talk about on those albums are things that are still like Blue Glitter Glove. That song, that song is ten years old, uh, but it still kind of resonates, you know, with, with what goes on, you know, in, in the culture. So, yes, yeah, I don't know. It's it's challenging, but I think it's more challenging. Okay, I look at my entire life and ebbs and flow. And another quote, by the way, but go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, and but when I look at it, I and I start to look at periods of my life where it seems like I was very, very creative. Where, like, for, for example, I'm an Emmy Award winning artist. So at the time when we actually were writing songs that ended up on this soundtrack where we were at the Emmys, at the same time I was in a band called that too. At the same time I was making like, you know, A's and B's and the PhD studies and I was teaching, right? And so instead of me starting to think about how am I able to do all that? And then sometimes, you know, I get up in the morning and go use the bathroom. I only had the strength to get out the toilet for real, right? So what was, what, what was the difference? And so I started looking at the environment in which I was living in. And so I tried to create the, a certain environment. I, I call it my productivity feng shui. And if, if the environment is right, then, then, the, then all this stuff happens. And so that's what I do. I just focus on environmental factors. And, and people are simply things in my environment. So Two. in a way, teaching came later. Right? What you mean? I, you were doing all this before teaching, and then you grabbed on to teaching. Nah, nah. No. So I started rapping in the sixth grade because I had a speech impediment <laughs> and rapping was the only way I didn't stutter. 
Mm-hmm. So I didn't even. So by the time people started rapping and, and had a career out of it, it was. It's like falling in love with basketball, and then you get to you get to be eighteen. You're like, "There's an NBA. <laughs> like <laughs> you you get paid to do this. <laughs> like you know what I mean? I I really grew up in a time where you know all of my friends rap. That's what we did. Like I grew up beating on the lunchroom table and beatboxing in the bathroom when you hit an echo in the corner. Like you know, it was just that's what we did. So it really wasn't I'm gonna rap to make it. It was like oh. This is this is a cool thing to do. I can string together a hundred words and make them. So the first hook I ever wrote, now I tell you, I was in college. So imagine I've been rapping since the sixth grade, and that's all I've been working on. Not songs, just raps. So I would show up and rap, rap, top the top, la, 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 la. And so a friend of mine said, Hey, listen, you got any songs? I said, What you talking about? I just did a song. It's like, no, you're just doing raps. You don't have a hook, you don't have a bridge. And so that's when I started writing choruses. Like, my first chorus is, I never had a chorus before this. I used to just say my rhymes from start to finish. But then this, homie hooked me up and made me take a second look. You can't fish for hits without a hook. I never had a chorus. So so that was my first chorus. But before that, I just rap, 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 rap. Okay, that's three minutes. That's a song. Because those were my favorite rap songs at the time with just people that rap. So, yeah. So... I had never not been rapping. So, you know what I mean? So, it really wasn't. So, when I started teaching, I had a record deal. I was rapping in college. You know, like when Bill Bellamy, he was a comedian then. He is one now. He can't even be. I was the opening act, rapping. So, you know, I really, you know, I never not rap. Cool. Can I ask you to say one one more area, uh, which is something about Birmingham. Um one of the one of the uh, Chris mentioned when I, I introduced uh, um, Parvati is part of a community. Anyway, one of the communities that I also mess around with is LRNG, and LRNG is coming into Birmingham big time, and leaving a lot of the politics and everything else behind. I'm totally fascinated by their idea that and other people's idea that the community can be an edu- a place of education, that lots mm. of different places in the community can be. So I want to hold on to that vision for them. And, and one of the, um, w- they're coming into Birmingham. And when, when, they, when I hear that, I say, do you know Al? <laughs> because, be, so, so that's, that's my background. I need that. to meet them. I don't know them, but they I need know. to know me. Yeah, but that's my get background. Yeah, that's my background to ask you. How do you use the city for your, you know, as, as a place of learning? Okay, Christ, so. By the way. Yeah. yeah. What's Birmingham okay, so what, mean to you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Birmingham is like the, is the place that I think, you know, I became a man. So I didn't really realize the perspective of Bessemer in Birmingham until I went to college in UAB, right? So my first day of class, right? And it's one of those huge lecture halls, you know? And the professor, I remember he read the entire syllabus. And he says, and you'll understand every word I just read unless you're from Bessemer. And everybody starts to laugh. But the joke was that he knew and everybody else in there knew there wasn't anybody in here from Bessemer so we could tell that joke. But I'm in there for Bessemer. I, I didn't know why it was funny, but it's because you knew that y'all don't go to college. Bessemer is kind of like, you know, the asshole of, of Jefferson County, I guess you could say. It's, it's you know, um, it's not thought of as a positive place. And so uh, I realized that going to Birmingham. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it, it, instead of making me like, I guess, Sean Bessmer or whatever, it's kind of like I got a UAB personalized tag and I put B-E-H-M-A on the tag, Bevma, because that's how we used to say it. We really didn't pronounce the S. You can say, I'm from Bessemer. No, I'm from Bevma. And so those were my tags. I want them to know it's somebody from Bevma here. You know, come here talking to know it. So, um, and it's, it's, it's the place that kind of like, you know, I, I got, I think, a better understanding of what racism is. Dr. Huntley, uh, I took African-American to stu- uh, African American studies from Dr. Huntley. And when I was in college, this is 1990, so right after the 80s, right? So in, in the 90s, we was, I remember getting a 
parade permit to march in the homecoming parade to protest the fact that we didn't have an African American studies department, right? We was marching like so, and there's an African American studies department at UAB now. So a lot of what I learned that you can actually be an organized group of people and actually change stuff or think you can change stuff. And there are people that may be a part of an institution that you think is the problem that might not be the problem. You know what I'm saying? So I, I guess Birmingham is that place, you know, that I kind of got a global view of things, really. Well, I, I guess I hon- I honed my global view because my mom was working at UAB at the time, but actually going, staying on campus, being a resident assistant, interacting with people with so many different places. Yeah. And that's still important to you, no? Oh, I mean- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, Birmingham is a town. And that's the thing that I think a lot of times if you're not from here, you don't really realize because you. There's some type of ordinance where you can't build tall buildings in Birmingham. Like the tallest building is in Birmingham is legally as tall as you can build. Right? So that's a preventative type growing mechanism. You know what I mean? Um, And so it's kind of like we have wide streets, short buildings. So that's for like transit population. That's for people to come in and spend their money and leave. That's that's, that's designed for this, you know. And so they like right now they they're they're doing construction on the freeway or whatever. It's a place of poverty. Uh, the poverty level is really really high, um, and it's a place where you can see um, you can see gentrification and how helpless you are to stop it. Because I don't think gentrification is a color; it's more of a culture, and it's a culture of those that have get opportunity. You know what I'm saying? And so right now, I think by and large, I'm learning in Birmingham. And what I'm learning, you want to say like the education I'm getting, I'm learning that the way the powers that be try to help is to make it real, real easy for people to go into business. But you cannot go into business without capital. Like it's not called capitalism for nothing. And so Mm -hmm. to put these so-called opportunities up and then watch people from everywhere in the world that are more affluent come take advantage of these opportunities and pretend like you bringing jobs to an area is, is not a new game. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, you have to give people shit. Like, that's just how to fix it. Like, you can't... Um, I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois, uh, however you want to say it. Um, that, yeah, but, but But I... But I think that he coined the phrase, uh, poverty and true education cannot coexist. So if a person's education does not improve their impoverished condition, it's not education. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a lot of, you know, not education going on, you know, and and not just in my city, but just that is the problem. The, The problem is. What we are teaching people in poverty does not directly improve their impoverished condition. So it's not education. It's indoctrination is what it is. Cool. But yeah. I um, want to release us all here and we, we could go on forever, I think. But um, obviously you're educating a lot of us in lots of different spheres. So thank you for doing that. Um, the, the actress who plays the um, in in Roma, um, who she was trained as a um, a teacher first, and then she got this job in in the movie. And she's been wondering. She was interviewed, and she said, "You know, can I can I accomplish the goals that I was trying to accomplish in film as a teacher in film?" And I'm like. And I thought of you, Al, and I thought, well, she doesn't have to choose. She can do both. Um, but she realized that she is teaching also through her work in film. So just thank you for all of the art and wonderful work you do. And good luck um, this weekend. I would love, I, I would love the, to know what yeah. you think of the album. If you want to review it or something, that would be cool. Like, feedback is cool, just, just in general. Uh, and if anybody, all of you, any of you, like, you know, just drop me a line. I will do that. Yep, yep. I think I think we have invented adult contemporary hip hop. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's it's very accessible. So in that way, I mean, I'll say that. I mean, but and and yeah, if that's what you mean. I mean, I get it. <laughs> and I mean, I was worried that I wouldn't. But... <laughs> right, you see? You see what I mean? Right? I'm telling you, it sneaks up on you. It goes with everything. It it's 27 minutes long. If you listen That's to right. the first song twice, it's 31 minutes. It's perfect for treadmill. I, <laughs> I know. I, I did that for us. That's hilarious because I just put it. I just put it on. I repeat for the treadmill about an I'm hour ago. You. So there you go. It's thirty-one <laughs> minutes. If you listen you to the first that? song twice, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, all this is marketing. I'm gonna do a hustling backwards challenge. We're gonna do thirty-one minute workout. All of it's coming. I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This is the one. This is the year. I'm building right. it all. I'm doing it all. I'm doing it all. Listen, I've been to the other side. I've been all the way to the South Pole. I touched the firmament. I've been back. I'm telling you. I'm and telling and, you. Your, and your son's 19 now, so, and he's got a job. <laughs> hey, so, hey. hey. <laughs> Thank you so I much for sharing tonight. Thanks so much. <laughs> Anytime. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Peace.